So welcome to this uh, third seminar in the Brick Court Arbitration webinar mini series. Today we're looking at issues concerning enforcement of arbitral awards, or rather we're looking at circumstances where the losing party might be able to prevent enforcement. And there are three particular aspects that we're going to examine. First of all, extension of time in which to challenge the award with a particular emphasis on what is the effect of fraud. Secondly, state immunity. Immunity claimed by a state and therefore saying that the award cannot be enforced against it. And thirdly, a defence to enforcement of the awards enforcement being contrary to public policy. Now, all these three have been the subject of recent case law, and I think it's clear that they are all developing areas. So the first topic uh, is going to be dealt with by Tom Pascoe. Tom is a junior barrister at Brick Court Chambers, specialising uh, specializing in commercial and competition litigation. He's been involved in several of the recent cases on challenges to arbitral awards, including the fraud challenge in the RBRG case before the Court of Appeal. Also, the Raga litigation, and most recently, Nigeria against the process and industrial development case. That concerns an award of 10 billion US dollars, and it's been described as one of the world's largest lawsuits. Tom, over to you. Thank you very much, Sir Richard. Paul, could we have my first slide up, please? So I, I'm going to talk about um, extensions of time, uh, particularly in the fraud context. And uh, with apologies for those who will be very familiar with the framework, I should begin just by outlining that there are three routes of challenging an award under the 1996 Act, uh, namely lack of jurisdiction, uh, serious irregularity, including fraud or breach of public policy, uh, which Dave is going to cover in his later talk, um, and unless the parties have opted out, error of law. Um, any challenge has to be brought uh, within a fairly short 28-day uh, time limit. You get that from section 70, subsection 3 of the Act. Uh, but there is a discretion to extend time under section 80, subsection 5. Now, the statute itself uh, doesn't give any guidance on the circumstances in which uh, such an extension uh, should be granted. Uh, Paul, if we could turn over, please. Um, but that void um, has been filled uh, by Mr. Justice Coleman in the Carmenet case. Um, in that case, he distilled uh, the previous case law on extensions of time and identified seven uh, particular factors which the court should generally take into account uh, when deciding whether to give permission uh, to bring a challenge out of time. Um, now, as I say, these factors don't come from the statutes um, themselves. They are judge made, uh, nor are they supposed uh, to be read as a statute or as though they were written in stone. Uh, but it's fair to say that in practice, uh, judges uh, do tend uh, to run through each of the factors one by one. And uh, this particular passage of Karl Neft has therefore hardened into something coming close. Uh, to a statutory test. Um, now, one general point uh, to mention about the Karmeneff test is that there has been some debate in the case law about whether the first three factors uh, relating to the length of the delay, uh, the reasonableness of the appellant's conduct in letting time run out, and the question of whether the respondent has contributed to that delay um, should be treated as primary factors. Um, 
in a case called Nagasina Naviera in the early noughties, uh, Lord Justice Mance held that they should, and that the remaining factors were essentially sort of window dressing uh, that were subservient to those first three factors. Uh, but more recently, uh, Mrs. Justice Carr in the Ali Alawi case said that that is not a hard edged rule. Um, this is really just a question uh, to be determined on a case by case basis. And, and that position was um, endorsed even more recently um, in the Nigeria case that I will come on to. Um, it's also important uh, to point out that empirically, uh, successful applications under the CARMEF factors are very rare. Uh, there's an interesting survey uh, by Sir Michael Burton in the State A and Party B case um, where he, he identifies 11 reported applications for extensions of time under CARMEFT, of which only one succeeded. Now, um, I think that there are a couple of cases missed out of that survey, but on any view, uh, the overall message is clear. Um, an appellant uh, seeking an extension under these criteria faces um, a very high hurdle. If I could have the next slide, please, Paul. Um, now, Carnet itself was not a case about fraud. Um, it concerned a jurisdiction challenge, and one can see that in cases like that, um, it's unlikely, uh, but not impossible, that the challenge will depend on some hidden fact uh, that's been discovered after the conclusion of the arbitration and the short 28-day uh, period for uh, appealing. Um, but the CARMEF factors uh, are likely to play out very differently. In particular, uh, the reasonableness factor um, in a case of fraud, where the very nature of the allegation is that certain facts have been uh, deliberately withheld from the appellant. And that is perhaps why Russell in his text says that um, cases of alleged fraud um, are arguably to be treated as special cases uh, for extension of time purposes. One can see uh, how in practice uh, that might play out uh, by taking a couple of examples of successful applications from the case law. Um, the Chantier de l'Atlantique case and the Electrum case. Um, both of those cases concern situations where the losing party to an arbitration uh, had been tipped off in uh, the first case through an informant, and in the second case uh, through disclosure in another jurisdiction, uh, that the evidence relied upon uh, by the successful party had been in some way misleading or incomplete. Um, in the first case, Mr. Justice Flo, as he then was, and in the second, our, our esteemed host, uh, Mr. Justice Aikens, as he then was, um, held that it had been perfectly reasonable um, for the party to, to wait for the tip-off and then take um, a short period, in each case for about one month, uh, to investigate uh, the alleged fraud and perjury uh, before pressing the button on a fraud challenge. Um, so in both cases, an extension of around one month was uh, granted. If we could have the next slide, please, Paul. Um, now, those two cases... Uh, concerned situations where the court found that the appellant had acted reasonably in bringing the fraud challenge uh, when it did. Uh, but there's an interesting question of principle as to whether that should matter at all. Uh, putting it another way, should a fraudster be allowed to get away with it and uh, cock a snoop at the innocent party uh, by saying that that party was less diligent than it should have been, in discovering uh, the fraud when it did. Now, that is the question that was recently considered by the Supreme Court uh, in Takar in the different but related context of setting aside judgments for fraud. Uh, in that case, uh, the appellant, um, a relatively elderly lady, had had judgment entered against her based on documents that she had no recollection of signing uh, but she had not attempted to prove at the trial that her signature on the documents was forged. 
after the litigation um, ended, um, she approached a handwriting expert who confirmed her suspicion uh, that the signatures on the documents uh, were not hers, and she applied to set aside uh, the judgment. The key, uh, the key judgment is that of Lord Kerr, and in particular at paragraph 54 that you can see on the slide, um, he repeated a mantra from a Can Canadian case uh, that nobody is required to be perpetually on guard uh, looking out for the fraud of other parties. And his conclusion, um, based on that mantra, was that a requirement of reasonable diligence should not be imposed on the party seeking to set aside uh, the judgment. So the position, at least in respect of court judgments, is that a party can apply to set them aside, uh, however late, on grounds of fraud, um, provided uh, one of two exceptions doesn't apply. Uh, first, that the fraud um, was already raised and rejected in the original hearing, or secondly, that there had been some deliberate tactical decision uh, not to allege it earlier. Uh, the Supreme Court's judgment um, sets, uh, sets the approach in relation uh, to court judgments on a potential collision course um, with the Karmnef test, because you'll remember that the Karmnef test is one of its uh, factors, factor number two, uh, requires the courts to interrogate whether the appellant has acted reasonably. And in a fraud case, that will mean acted reasonably in uncovering the fraud. Whereas under TACAR, it's not even legitimate for the court to ask that question. So the million dollar question is, does or should TACAR apply to arbitration? Um, on the one hand, the Supreme Court's ruling is very generous to appellants, uh, which arguably cuts across the strong policy in favour of the finality of arbitral awards. Uh, but on the other hand, are the policy arguments really so different uh, in relation to final judgment of a court? Uh, the different contexts is perhaps what persuaded Mrs. Justice Cockerell uh, recently in the ZCCN case to say that it was by no means clear uh, that TACAR uh, should apply in the arbitration context. But that was a very tentative um, remark made in passing and there had been no serious argument on the point. Uh, which brings us uh, to the Nigeria case. If I could have the next slide, please, Paul. Um, I should, as, as Sir Richard mentioned, declare an interest that I, I was and am a junior counsel for Nigeria in this case. Um, it concerns a gas processing contract awarded by the Nigerian government back in 2009. Uh, the contract was never performed by either side and uh, the respondent, Process and Industrial Development Limited, obtained an award from a tribunal uh, comprising uh, Lord Hoffman, Sir Anthony Evans, and uh, a Nigerian arbitrator, Chief Bio Ojo, uh, for some $6.6 .6 billion uh, plus 7% interest, which is still running. Uh, the amount said to be outstanding under the award is currently some $10 billion. And just to place that into context, that represents around five times what Nigeria spends per year on education and eight times its annual national health budget. Uh, so this is, in that respect at least, a truly extraordinary award. Um, in 2019, Nigeria commenced a full-scale uh, criminal investigation into the circumstances of the contract and uncovered what it says uh, to be evidence of serious bribery and corruption. Uh, it wished to set aside the award, uh, but was by that point uh, between three and five years out of time, depending on which award you take as your starting point. And it therefore asks, um, in the judge's own words, uh, for an unprecedented extension of time. Uh, now, for anyone looking uh, for a shortcut through the judgment, I would commend uh, paragraphs 167 to 176 and 261 to 276 as a statement on the law on extensions of time in fraud cases. And I would like uh, to pick out uh, just four key points from the judgment for today. First, and I don't think it was ever really an issue, 
Um, CalMNEF does remain uh, the overall framework for deciding whether to grant an extension of time for fraud challenges. Secondly, um, in an extension of time application, the judge's impression of the merits of the underlying challenge are very, very important. Uh, so Ross Cranston uh, forms the view on the evidence before him that Nigeria had a strong prima facie case um, that uh, the awards and the contract on which uh, they were based uh, were tainted by fraud and corruption. Um, in another case where, where the judge concludes that the uh, fraud challenge looks speculative, one can see that the facts may well play out uh, rather differently. Um, thirdly, and this is perhaps the key innovation of the judgment, uh, Sir Ross Cranston said that the court should examine whether there has been a trigger um, which would prompt a reasonable party to investigate fraud. Now, thinking back to the two example cases I just mentioned of Chantier de l'Atlantique um, and Electrum, uh, there was such a trigger that had been a tip off. Uh, but what happens where you just have a, a sort of lingering suspicion that there is something odd about the award, um, but nothing proactively to put you on notice of potential fraud? Well, uh, Sir Ross Cranston thought that was very important. And in circumstances where the, there is no such trigger, um, a party can rarely be uh, criticised as acting unreasonably for failing uh, proactively to commence a full-scale investigation. Um, and finally, perhaps most uh, interestingly from a point of principle, um, Sir Ross Cranston said that had it been necessary, uh, he would have decided that TACAR does apply to arbitration. Uh, so in fact, it's not necessary to ask uh, whether the appellant has acted reasonably at all. Um, so I round off with the question, has there been a step change uh, in the approach to fraud challenges in arbitration since TACAR? Uh, technically, that's still an open question in the sense that there has been no binding decision one way or another. So Ross Cranston's comments were over to her. Um, but it's obviously true that in that Nigeria case, uh, the court took a step uh, towards assimilating, assimilating TACAR into uh, the arbitration context. But one can see in another case where the merits, the perceived merits are perhaps less strong, uh, the court may be less inclined uh, to open the door to late challenges. Uh, so bringing TACAR within the umbrella of arbitration is not yet a done deal. Um, this is very much an issue to watch, and I have no doubt that it will be subject um, of some uh, interesting litigation and appeals in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Tom. Now, before we move on to the next topic, which is state immunity, just a reminder that you are very welcome to pose questions to the panelists. Uh, they would like to hear your questions, and I'm sure you want to hear their answers. So please, Tap in a question if you've got one, and we'll deal with them at the end uh, after David Heaton has spoken. Now we move on to state immunity then. And uh, Zara is going to deal with this. She is a junior barrister at Brickcourt Chambers. She has a broad practice encompassing commercial, public, and public international law. She has advised extensively in relation to state and diplomatic immunities and appeared unled indeed in the Avionics Technologies Limited and Federal Republic of Nigeria case. Zara was also recently appointed to the Attorney General's Public International Law Panel, Panel C, that's a panel of course of junior counsel to the Crown and a particularly prestigious position to be in. Zara, over to you. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, so I'll be touching on two of the provisions of the State Immunity Act that are relevant in the context of the enforcement of arbitration awards against foreign states. Um, they're not the only provisions that are relevant, but there are two in which there has been some recent um, interesting judgments, or at least judgments that were weighted. Um, if we could go to the first slide, please, Paul. Thank you. 
So as many of you will be aware, the starting point in relation to foreign states and the domestic courts is set out in section one, subsection one of the State Immunity Act 1978, which provides that state is immune from the jurisdiction of the courts of the United Kingdom, except as provided in the following provisions of this act. So a lesser claimant can bring their case within one of the exceptions set out in the State Immunity Act, the general position is that a foreign state is immune. Section one, subsection two, which I haven't set out in the slide, provides that a court shall give effect to the immunity conferred by section one, even if the state does not appear in the proceedings in question. So the, the court has to be proactive about the question of state immunity and, um, and must give effect to the provisions of the act. The relevant exception in the context of arbitration is, of course, Section 9 of the State Immunity Act, which provides that where a state has agreed in writing to submit a dispute that has arisen or may arise to arbitration, the state is not immune as respects proceedings in the courts of the United Kingdom, which relate to the arbitration. In terms of the scope of Section 9, has been held that enforcement proceedings fall within its scope, and that was the judgment of the Court of Appeal in Spencer Petroleum. Um, and furthermore, because the what underpins this provision is essentially the consent of the state, um, where the state disputes the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal, that issue needs to be determined by the court before the claim can be said to fall within the scope of Section 9. In that context, it's open to the state to make objections that were not made before the arbitral tribunal. That was the effect of the judgment of Mr. Justice Butcher in the commercial court in the case of Tatsneft and Ukraine. He also held that the state wasn't limited to objections that it made before the arbitral tribunal. And so there's no equivalent of Section 73 of the Arbitration, um, of the arbitration Act, sorry, 1996, which, which prevents um, a claimant from, sorry, a defendant from objecting to a jurisdiction where they didn't make those objections before the tribunal. So in the context of state immunity, it's open to the state to make objections that it didn't make before the arbitral tribunal. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Now, in terms of timing, um, the Court of Appeal and ETI Euro Telecom International emphasised that state immunity must be determined as early as possible in the proceedings. So when making a without notice application, the claimant must be prepared to deal with issues of state immunity. And of course, full and frank disclosure applies in this context. So if the claimant foresees that the, the state might have objections to jurisdiction, um, that, that it would rely on, on the, to, to argue that Section 9 doesn't apply, then those objections must be made clear to the court when making without a without notice application. I'm not going to read out the, um, that quotation from um, the judgment of the Court of Appeal, but I've set it out there for reference. If we could go to the next um, slide, please. So sometimes there are good reasons for staying an application under part 11. And then the question arises as to what powers the court has in relation to the state defendant pending determination of its application that is immune from the jurisdiction of the court. And that issue arose in the recent case of Holly Enterprises Limited and others and the Russian Federation, which is the latest in the UCOS saga. Um, the, the case was decided by Mr. Justice Henshaw and um, in that case, the state's part 11 application had been stayed pending resolution of its challenge to the arbitration award in The Hague. The claimants made an application to lift the stay, but also applied for security under section 103.5 of the Arbitration Act 1996. Mr. Justice Henshaw in the passage that I've set out, but also in, in other passages of his judgment, um, essentially decided that he didn't have jurisdiction to order security under section 103.5 prior to a determination that the state lacks immunity. So that's the latest development in this line of cases. Um, there are other cases um, it, it, that, that make similar points in relation to freezing injunctions or other injunctions against the state. That unless the issue of state immunity has been determined, the court lacks jurisdiction to um, exercise its other powers. 
Um, if we could go to the fourth slide, please. So the other issue I wanted to touch on briefly today is Section 12 of the State Immunity Act. Um, Section 12 of the State Immunity Act provides that any writ or other document required to be served for instituting proceedings against the state shall be served by being transmitted through the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the state, and service shall be deemed to have, have been effected when the writ or document is received by the ministry. In the Court of Appeal judgments in General Dynamics United Kingdom Limited and Libya, the Court of Appeal held that it wasn't mandatory under Section 12.1 of the Act for either the arbitration claim form or the order permitting enforcement of the award to be served through the FCO. And so because they weren't mandatory under the State Immunity Act, they were only um, service was only pursuant to the CPR, in particular CPR Rule 62.18. And given that service was in relation to a state, then Rule 6.44 also applied. Now, given that service was pursuant to the CPR, the Court of Appeal also held the court had jurisdiction in an appropriate case to dispense with service of such an order in accordance with CPR 6.16 and or 6.28 um, in exceptional circumstances. And um, in the first instance judgment of Mr. Justice, um, so I think it was in fact Lord Justice Mails at the time that he gave the judgment, Lord Justice Mails had held that had he had the discretion, which in his judgment he didn't have, but had he had the discretion to um, dispense with service, then he would have held that there were exceptional circumstances. So the Court of Appeal essentially relied on his judgment that there were exceptional circumstances and held that, um, that there, there was sufficient ground to dispense with service on the facts of the case. Now, the problem with the Court of Appeal's judgment is that it appears to boil the issue down to one of balancing the public policy of ensuring that arbitration awards can be enforced against what the court referred to as sensitivities about impeding a foreign state. Whereas the question really ought to have been asking whether customary international law requires service of some document in order to impede a foreign state and further requires that such service is conducted through the appropriate diplomatic channels. Um, the defendant state in that case had relied on a number of provisions in um, the UN Convention, for example, on, on jurisdictional immunities, as well as the European Convention on State Immunity, to argue that there was a customary international law requirement for a state to be impeded through service of a document, that it wasn't good enough, essentially, to impede a state without serving on it a document that would set um, set into motion the action that it then must take to defend its position. Um, now, this question is currently before the Supreme Court and judgment is being awaited um, by the Supreme Court. So I, I think submissions were heard last term in relation to uh, the appeal and judgment is currently awaited. So it will be a really interesting one to look out for. Um, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, that will be a very interesting judgment or judgments when they come. I, I have to say I'm rather puzzled by the Court of Appeals approach in that case, but it's not for me to say. Now we're going to move on to public policy next. And as we all know, public policy is an unruly horse. So David Heaton is going to tell us how to control this unruly horse. David is a junior barrister at Brick Court Chambers. He has a practice that focuses on commercial law, including arbitration, but also public law. He had a career in Australia as an associate to Justice Hayne in the High Court of Australia, uh, but then came to the English Bar and was called here in 2015, having done various other things in Australia beforehand. He's been involved as counsel in several arbitrations, 
including contractual and exit claims, and in particular, MOL against Croatia and Croatia against MOL. Large oil and gas arbitrations, one of which is still continuing, and applications in relation to enforce an award, such as Ministry of Defense and Support for Armed Forces of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the International Military Services Limited, which was in the Court of Appeal last year. David, over to you. Thank you very much, Sir Richard. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get too far in, in taming the horse, but we can certainly identify it in the course of this seminar and consider the circumstances in which it might um, cause some trouble. Uh, the structure of my presentation today will be to look at, first of all, the domestic and international legal basis for the court's intervention on grounds of public policy, to look at the general approach to public policy that courts take insofar as that can be identified, and then to consider situations where public policy might be relevant in relation to enforcement or setting aside an award in England and Wales. Uh, the obvious starting point is that on the slide before you, and that is the New York Convention. That convention defines the circumstances generally in which states will recognize international arbitral awards as they're defined in that convention. They need to meet certain criteria. As you can see there, in Article 5.2, there is an express provision that permits a state not to enforce an arbitral award where to do so would be contrary to the public policy of that state. Could move to the next slide, please. Uh, it's also interesting in this context to, to look at the UNCITRAL model arbitration law, which while not adopted in the UK, albeit certain parts of the Arbitration Act might be thought to reflect it, uh, it is adopted in a number of other places. So for example, Australia. That model law, again, recognises that public policy may be both grounds to challenge an award in the place of its curia law or seat, and also to refuse enforcement of an award. And again, you see that in the provision set out in the slide, uh, Article 34.2, in relation to setting aside an award in the jurisdiction of its seat, and Article 36, in relation to the enforcement of an award of a, where the seat is not um, that of the state in question. Next slide, please, Paul. Now, those provisions, or at least the substance of them, are also present in the Arbitration Act 1996. Here. As Tom mentioned, there are three grounds for setting aside an award one of which is a serious irregularity in relation to that award. And the Arbitration Act itself defines those circumstances that constitute serious irregularity. One of those is that in section 68, sub 2, paragraph G. And that is where an award was obtained by fraud or the award or the way in which it was procured are contrary to public policy. Of course, it's also necessary to establish on any application uh, to set aside serious irregularity um, that the irregularity uh, has caused or will cause substantial injustice to the applicant. That is to say, there is always a discretion, even if one establishes some public policy issue, to enforce the award nonetheless, though the cases suggest that would be sparingly exercised. Move on to the next slide, please. Uh, the Arbitration Act, unsurprisingly, also reflects Article 5.2 of the New York Convention, in particular in Section 103.3, and that provides, similarly to 68.2G, that recognition or enforcement of an award may be refused, where, relevantly, it would be contrary to public policy to recognise or to enforce the award. Next slide, please, Paul. So having identified the legal basis for the setting aside of awards and grounds of public policy, it's perhaps useful to stand back and reflect on the approach generally to the exercise of such power by courts around the world. 
Uh, I've attempted no reference summary of commentaries here because there are far too many to include on a slide. But it does seem when one looks around that there is somewhat of a consensus that public policy is or at least should be a narrow ground and in general that it applies only to what might be called grave or serious or extreme issues and situations. But there are, of course, aberrations both as to certain jurisdictions and also as to the way that comes to be applied in particular cases, as is inevitably the case. It's also perhaps obviously the case that public policy is an inherently protean or perhaps less charitably nebulous concept, the kind of concept that inherently gives some room to a court to do what it might perceive as practical justice in the circumstances of the case. You see on the slide here a quote that reflects the general approach of the English courts to considerations of public policy in this context. The quote from Mr. Justice Corosis even was, the key points that I think emerge from this are that public policy, that the public policy in issue is that of England and Wales in maintaining the fair and orderly administration of justice. So the public policy, when one comes to enforce or seek to set aside in the courts of England and Wales, the public policy that is relevant is that of the forum. Secondly, the courts will take um, an approach of what Mr. Justice Gross, as he then was, called extreme caution, and in general are very reluctant to set aside an award. And as we'll see, that is the more so where the matters that give rise to the public policy argument have been ventilated before and rejected by the tribunal itself. Finally, it's important to note this is a nascent and developing area. Um, while the grounds of public policy, or rather the grounds of public policy are not closed, and many of the textbooks, Russell in particular, is uh, alive to this and keen to point out that further arguments may well be possible. Could we move to the next slide, please? It's not possible in the confines of this seminar to undertake any kind of exhaustive consideration of when uh, public policy might objection to enforcement might succeed or might not. However, I thought it may be useful to give at least some examples and some thoughts as to how this might work in particular cases. And the first bullet on the slide reflects that it appears to be reasonably well established that where on the face of the award, so if one's actually looking at the, the award itself and the reasons given, that award gives effect to an illegal contract or an enterprise or enterprise in the place of performance in England and Wales, or to a corrupt practice, that award would not be enforced. And examples that have been mentioned in the cases are a contract to pay a bribe, it's an overture example given by Mr. Justice Phillips, as he then was in the Sino court case, and a, a contract to smuggle carpets out of Iran, which was in fact the, the subject of the Court of Appeals decision in the Solomon case where uh, enforcement was refused. A second situation in which it seems to be relatively clear that public policy might lead to a refusal of enforcement is where, uh, in the words of Mr. Justice Coleman in Westcare, a contract is indisputably illegal at common law um, and an award is then issued based on it. But again, where this point was taken before the tribunal, Mr. Justice Coleman and the Court of Appeal above him seemingly also agrees that the court has a discretion as to whether in all the circumstances it considers that the public policy concern outweighs the interest in the finality of awards. Uh, and that perhaps reflects the general discretion one has in um, certainly in section 68 of the act when seeking to set aside an English seated arbitration. It might perhaps be a little bit harder in principle to justify the exercise of that kind of discretion in relation to enforcement under 100 section 103, at least in the absence of a um, statutory requirement uh, for prejudice. Um, what is on any view clear though, is as mentioned before, where the issue said to give rise to the public policy concern has been ventilated and lost before the tribunal, is often very difficult to establish it as a public policy objection to enforcement. 
A further example given in the Sino court case, again, Obita by Mr. Justice Phillips, was a situation where an award um, upheld a claim to cut to payment that was itself based on fraudulent documents, either admittedly fraudulent or found by the tribunal to have been forgeries. And indeed, in those circumstances, one might think that um, there, there would be a number of grounds to set aside an award. But interestingly, in that particular case, Mr. Justice Phillips found, uh, and I should say that's a case in which Tom appeared, is, is much better qualified to speak to it than I am. But Mr. Justice Phillips found that um, the fraudulent conduct in question was not the basis for the award, and further that the issue of whether that fraudulent conduct barred the claim was raised before and dismissed by the tribunal. And in those circumstances, he considered that there was not a public policy basis to refuse the enforcement of the award. That case is perhaps a good illustration of the general reluctance of the court to intervene. A, a final point we have on the slide is whether um, one on which, as far as I can see, there are no decisions and which seems difficult, but perhaps not quite inconceivable to arise in practice. And that might be an argument that where an award has somehow been made in breach of an anti-suit injunction, um, that award ought not to be enforced. That principle is reflected in relation to the enforcement of foreign judgments in Section 32 of the Civil uh, Jurisdiction and Judgments Act 1982. It would seem that at least in principle, the same concern would apply in relation to an arbitral award that had somehow been procured contrary to an injunction uh, restraining the pr proceeding with that arbitration. Now, it might be hard immediately to see circumstances where this could arise, but conceivably that might be so where there was refusal to obtain, uh, to observe rather, an alternative dispute resolution mechanism where there is a jurisdiction dispute as to whether a dispute falls within an arbitration clause at all, or perhaps uh, where there is a dispute as to which of several possible arbitration agreements applies to a particular dispute. And one might also query, and again, as far as I'm aware, there's no authority that deals with the issue, whether the failure to observe the order, observe any orders of a curial court made in assistance of an arbitration might itself give rise to public policy concerns. That might be more doubtful because it will doubtless be something that has been raised before the tribunal as reasons um, to make or not to make particular, particular factual findings or to proceed in a particular manner. Um, but it's certainly an idea that is possibly worth exploring should those circumstances arise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, David, for that. It raises a, a number of very interesting questions, which we might come on to in a minute. Now, so far, there's been a, just the slightest bit of reticence in putting questions to the panel. So whilst everyone is thinking about questions and formulating them, I'm going to step in and ask the panellists a couple of preliminary questions anyway. And I thought uh, we might start, Tom, with you and this interesting comment by Mrs. Justice Cockerell that TACAR might uh, not apply to arbitrations. Uh, and uh, Lord uh, Kerr's uh, statement about no need for reasonable diligence, et cetera, might not apply. But that uh, strikes me as somewhat odd uh, that Mrs. Justice Cockrell should take that view. Can you elaborate on what her reasoning was? Well, th there's a very short answer to that, which is that there's no, there's no real reasoning um, because she didn't need to decide the point. So it, it really is a, a fairly tentative remark. If I was to hazard a guess, at what her reasoning might have been, I expect it is that um, arbitration challenges, unlike challenges to judgments, are governed by a specific statutory scheme which lays down an express 
a time within which any challenges must be brought. And there is therefore no sort of warrant for reading across uh, common law rules on the circumstances in which judgments are to be set aside um, in the arbitration context, uh, particularly when there's a, there's a strongly recognised policy of um, upholding uh, arbitral awards, often between international parties. Yes, I can I can see that argument. Um, but on the other hand, given that uh, the the question of how you deal with particular aspects of challenges under Section 68 is only dealt with in a framework way uh, in the section. One might have thought that the question of, of how uh, you have to deal with issues of fraud is something that is in the case law. After all, it was in the Electrim case. Uh, so it, 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 it might be relevant. But I think it's uh, likely to be something we'll have to wait and see how the law develops on that. Now, whilst you've been speaking, we have had a question, an interesting question. I think it's probably one for David, and it raises the uh, question of how to deal with illegality in the context of public policy. And the question asks, uh, is an analogy with the relevance of TECA to challenges to arbitral awards based on fraud, does the panel believe that the balancing principles of Patel and Mirza should apply to challenges to awards based on illegality, notwithstanding the fact that the Court of Appeal rejected this argument in the sino core case? In the context of judgments tainted by illegality, in Magdiv against Zvetkov, it's interesting that Mrs. Justice Cockrell seemed less resistant to importing some of the public policy balancing concepts from Patel and Mercer, and in Colt Technology and SG Global, the court suggested there would be some assimilation between domestic and foreign illegality. Well, there's a lot of material in that one. David, do you want to hazard some views on that? Richard, I can... So it's an extremely learned question, if I may say so. Oh, okay. uh, and I won't pretend to have all of those authorities uh, immediately at my fingertips. I, mean, I think in fair, it's fair to say that at a high level, one can always draw on um, a court dealing with considerations of public policy in another context to think about how it might uh, approach public policy in the context of setting aside an arbitral award. But I do think um, it, it's probably not possible to apply the Patel and, I mean, as the Court of Appeal has held, I suppose. It's not possible to apply, at any rate, directly the Patel and Mirza the balancing principles uh, in this context, I think for two reasons. First of all, there is um, an inherent balancing exercise built in, as I've said, in the context of setting aside public policy, where one is struggling to balance, and the courts could have discretion to balance, the important interest in the finality of an award against um, whatever public policy consideration is advanced before the court. And that is something that's not present, at least in all cases of illegality with which Patel and Mirza deals. And I, I think the other point is that that finality consideration seems to, to my mind anyway, to receive a great deal more weight in the arbitral context than it might do, than the sort of commercial certainty consideration might do in the context of Patel and Mirza. Um, and the policy justification for that is the, the importance and the relative restraint that it's expected that domestic courts will show to arbitral awards. Yes, I wonder sometimes whether or not that hasn't uh, been elevated to too high a position in uh, the English courts. Um, despite obviously the, the fundamental background of the New York Convention, um, but maybe um, I'm I'm out uh, on a limb on that one. But it, I'm not. The, the consequences of Patel and Mirza uh, and the and the fundamental change in English law on that uh, will have to work its way through other other uh, 
aspects, won't it, in, including how illegality is to be treated in the context of possible enforcement of awards? As I said, Richard, I mean, it's an analogy that will inevitably be drawn. And I think it is also fair to say that appellate courts, I mean, this is very much a high level observation, but over the last 10 years have tended to move away from, in, in case of illegality, tended to move away generally from very bright line, clear kind of tests to a much more um, balancing and assessing proportionality style of analysis. So I suspect that's right. But I think as the law now stands, um, those bodies of principle do seem fairly distinct. I, I might just chip in as um, a member of the council team on the losing side of this argument in the Sinecore case. Um, as David said, one important aspect of Patel and Mirza is the balancing process. Uh, there is another important aspect, which is uh, how you ask whether the award is tainted by illegality in the first place. And uh, the old rules relating to illegality under the common law were that you, you essentially look to the pleadings and it's a very technical exercise. I think that the point that we were making in Sinecor was that you can go beyond that. You don't have to sort of uh, split apart uh, the pleadings and the, re the reasoning in the award. You, you can ask a, a much more holistic question. Well, it, is this fraud somehow bound up with the award? And, and that is, that's perhaps an angle where, where Patel and Merza has a greater role to play. Yes. Well, I think it's a, a watch this space uh, issue there. Zara, I, I wondered if I could ask you to elaborate on one aspect which you touched on in relation to state immunity. Uh, and how is it actually going to arise at the stage of uh, an attempt to challenge an award on the ground of state immunity. I was just thinking about this. Uh, for example, in the Dalla case, the, the government of Pakistan said it wasn't a party to the award to the arbitration agreement at all. Now, if it had been, there could have been issues of state immunity that might have arise, uh, arisen. And if my recollection is correct, counsel for uh, Pakistan reserved the question of whether or not state immunity could be pleaded uh, before me at first instance in Dalla. And I don't know what happened in subsequent courts, but I imagine that was also maintained. Now that's one area where state immunity could arise at the outset. Another could be, as you said, scope of the arbitration agreement itself and whether or not something was being dealt with in an award which was actually outside the scope and therefore uh, the, 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 the Section 9 didn't apply to that particular part. But are, there, are there other ways in which state immunity might apply? Um, where if it's general, why don't they just lose the immunity by going ahead and taking part in an arbitration? I can't see the argument uh, to say that they uh, that they can still bring it on at a later stage if they've waived it. So, it, it, Mr. Justice Butcher in Svenska, one of the arguments that was put to him was that the state had waived any objections to jurisdiction that it didn't expressly make. Um, so that's one of the ways that um, the claimant put, put its challenge um, to Mr. Justice Butcher. And he held that unless the state had expressly waived its immunity in, in the context of the arbitration proceedings or, or waived it in terms that were sufficiently broad to encompass um, state immunity, then it can't be taken to have waived its immunity because um, state immunity is, is the right, if it's a procedural right, you know, it's a protection for states that they're entitled to demand um, in, in the domestic courts of other states. And so I think it always arises, you know, it's the general position, unless a claimant can show that an exception applies. So it's sort of the other way around, if you like. It's not right. It's not for the state to argue that state immunity applies. One should assume that if impeding yes. states either directly or indirectly, that state immunity will apply, unless they can show that they come within the exception. And where you get the borderline cases are where the, the state wasn't even part of the arbitration and yet 
there's an argument that it, that it comes within the scope of Section 9. Um, and, and cases where the state, um, as I said, you know, disputes the jurisdiction of the tribunal and under the relevant bilateral investment treaty. Yes, well, that, that, uh, that obviously would, would be different. Can I ask you a different question um, relating to the general dynamics case? I know you're waiting for the judgment, but what, what was the, the reasoning of the Court of Appeal to say that um, the, the, uh, what seems to me perfectly mandatory uh, provisions in Section 12.1 uh, don't apply to instituting arbitrating arbitration proceedings? Because instituting proceedings is, seems to me general. Why did they say it didn't apply to arbitration proceedings? So I think the way that it's the court of win appeal... win in, in the Supreme Court. <laughs> Sorry? It sounds to me that would be an easy win in the Supreme Court, but maybe I've missed something. Yeah, so, so I think the, um, if I just turn up the actual language of Section 12, it refers to... Um, Sorry, one second. Maybe it's in my slides. I've got it here somewhere. Um, I think it, it refers to a writ or any other document required to initiate proceedings. Exactly. And, and so the court is very um, focuses on the language. It accepts the uh, it accepts an argument that is very much focused on the language. In that. Um, the, the way that you enforce an arbitration award pursuant to section um, 62, uh, rule 62.18 of the CPR is that you're not actually required to initiate proceedings. There isn't a document you must serve for the purposes of, of initiating proceedings because you make an without notice application simply for an order that, uh, that you can enforce um, for permission to enforce the arbitration awards. And so the Court of Appeal accepted that there wasn't a document that was required um, to initiate proceedings. And having accepted that argument, it then said, well, we're not within the scope of Section 12. We're only within the scope of the CPR in terms of serving the order once you obtain that order for permission. Um, one of the things that the, the court relied on in terms of, you know, rather than sort of starting in my general criticism of their approach, rather than starting from the position of well, what does customary international law require in this context, um, it, instead they were balancing different policy concerns. And one of the points that they made in the judgment, um, which seemed fairly questionable to me, is that, that a foreign state that has fully participated in arbitration proceedings is aware that there's going to be enforcement proceedings against it. And so it doesn't need the same protections provided by Section 12 in that context. But of course, you know, just one of the cases that I dealt with today, the UCOS, for example, yeah. is you know, massive arbitration award that was um, received in The Hague. And proceedings have been brought in all sorts of other jurisdictions against the Russian Federation in relation to that award. So it seems a little bit odd, the Court of Appeal, to think that if, if the state is aware that it has arbitrated and, you know, if there's an arbitration award against it in one state, that it doesn't necessarily require the same procedural protections in terms of enforcement in any other state. Yes. Well, it, it seems bizarre to me, but uh, is the is the uh, judgment expected imminently in, from the Supreme Court? I think it's expected in the next few months. I'm not actually instructed in the case. I'm just following it with interest. All right. Well, it's, it sounds to me an extremely interesting case, and and I think actually a very important one. In yeah. given that uh, these days um, cases uh, arbitration uh, proceedings against states seem to me at least to be becoming more common and so this is an yeah. issue which is going to be more relevant uh in the future yeah and i, well, I think one of the problems with the judgment of the court is that the rationale it applies could apply to other proceedings within it within the context of enforcement against the state so a charging order for example is obtained in by by means of a ex parte application that is then served on the state and the state has has the right to try to set it aside. And if you say within that context, anything obtained ex parte that you only have to then serve 
afterwards doesn't amount as a document initiating proceedings. You're then taking away the, the state's procedural protections in quite a few different contexts. And and other forms of enforcement. Um, could you could you uh, appoint a receiver? That would be depend on whether or not state immunity was applicable, wouldn't it? You, you then you then get different issues under Section 13 of the State Immunity Act in relation to the property itself. So if the property itself benefits from immunity, um, yeah. then 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 the you know new issues arise there. But but yes, I, I think potentially all sorts of other problems. Yeah, I I, I seem to remember having a case about that where there was an uh, an attempt to enforce against property of a central bank. Um, with, on which state immunity was claimed in respect of it. Uh, so yes, you're you're absolutely right. Now that there's one uh, l last question that I thought I would ask you, Tom, um, in, in relation to the famous factors um, set out uh, by uh, Mr. Justice Coleman, uh, and then Lord Justice Mant saying that the, the th first three runners. Uh, were the most important, and Lord Just Lady, rather Justice Carr, she now is uh, saying, "Oh no, they're not." Which which approach do you prefer? I think the temptation in all cases like this is to say it has to depend on the facts, and that that that, that must be right. That said, I, I think it it was useful for Lord Justice Mans to give some guidance as to the weight that will be afforded to each of the factors in the generality of cases. Um, it really focuses uh, the court's mind on, on the conduct of the litigants in particular, um, which in most cases will be the sort of determining factor for whether an extension should be granted. Um, I think clearly what Lord Justice Mant was motivated by was a desire not to allow the very final factor, which is overall fairness, swallow up the remaining factors yeah. so that it becomes a free-for-all. Yes, well, that, that, that must be right. It's all too easy to fall into that trap, I suppose. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, as it were, um, there we have it. A, a lot of questions that I think remain unanswered in relation to fraud and extensions of time, the scope and effectiveness of state immunity, and that unruly horse, public policy, all to be debated in cases in the future. Thank you very much indeed for listening in and watching in, uh, and um, we'll, we'll uh, await the next webinar on uh, whether it's arbitration or other topics. Thank you very much indeed.